How's everybody doing today? We miss our pastor, and of course I'm here trembling, shaking, trying not to show it. But the Lord is here. Amen. The Lord is here. You didn't waste your time coming today because you came for a special date with the Lord. And uh, man, I got, I got just so much that I want to share with you. I don't know how this is going to go. It, it, it can really tank and the Lord is going to be glorified anyway. Uh, you know that uh, the Bible Institute, we're having a special course. Uh, tomorrow is actually our second English class online only for English. Um, but we're talking about whatever happened or what happened to my church the story beyond the book of Acts and you don't want to miss out on that and we're going to be talking a little bit about that today but of course in our course we're going to be dealing about with what happened when God uh, visited the United States uh, you know Azusa Street California hello um, a revival that that was so great that people came back from mission fields by boat, weeks and weeks coming back because they wanted to see what is going on at Azusa Street. What is this thing about speaking in tongues? What is this thing about the Holy Spirit and miracles and signs? You may not be aware of this, but before that, most churches, so-called Christians, didn't even believe there was such a thing as speaking in tongues. Not for us, not for today. And so that's why there's such a need that we learn what scripture says about it. And also we're going to be delving a little bit into history in that course. So you're still welcome to join and sign up for that. Just go to the church's website, click on Fountain of Truth Bible Institute and get registered for that. We have a table over there in the back towards the missions wall. We're going to be selling some books. Um, most of them are going to be in Spanish, and I apologize for that. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. See, tongues, tongues. Um, the reason I mostly write in Spanish is because we have quite a few books in English by different authors, and there was hardly anything in Spanish. This is called No Ma'am, The Trinity is Not the Way. Uh, so if you have somebody in your family that uh, needs a little bit of help understanding why we believe in only one God, His name is Jesus, why we baptize in Jesus' name, why we believe the Holy Spirit still for us today, speaking in tongues. Uh, you need to give them one of this. I do have a couple of books in English. One uh, was uh, written in collaboration with Dr. David K. Bernard, uh, Dr. Norris, uh, and others, and it's on prophecy. Um, some time ago, there was people saying, Jesus already came back uh, in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. And we're like, no, he didn't. <laughs> we would know, all right? And so uh, it's, it's a point of view about prophecy and it needed to be corrected. So that's what the book is about. But today we're going to talk, we're going to be uh, talking about this following subject, speaking in tongues. Why? Speaking in tongues. Why? Are you ready? Yes. If you're called, you didn't worship hard enough. And so if you get like really chilly, you're welcome to clap, you know, and just, you know, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's a good workout. All right. Let's go to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And we're going to be in verse 28. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now this is, this is a, a portion from the Old Testament. We call it the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Joel was on one of the prophets of the Lord. And God announced through him his plan that he was going to pour out his spirit upon everyone. He says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, the Jewish people were expecting this and waiting for it for centuries. And they were looking forward to when this was going to happen. And in a little bit, you're going to understand a little bit of why that was so 
amazing for them. But let me take you back to the book of Genesis for a little bit, and, and we're going to make it all we're going to make it all the way to Revelation, believe it or not. And so you better fasten your seatbelts. I hope you brought some snacks. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. Listen to that. One language, one speech. The whole earth. Look at somebody and say, they only had one language. All right. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a, pla a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Notice how, now, if, if, you, if you have read your Bible... All right, Genesis 11 comes way after Genesis 6. Genesis 6 is when God starts on the plan for the flood. And so 7, 8, 9, and 10, they're going to tell you the story about the flood and how all of humanity was wiped out. And then, of course, Noah and his sons are uh, repopulating the earth. And so this is a few generations after that. And so they seem to have the fear that another flood may come. They soon forgot the promise of God that he wasn't going to flood the whole earth ever again. But now, so they are getting together and they say, okay, if, if in case that happens, let us make ourselves a big tower whose top reaches the heavens. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them there's power in unity there's power for evil and there's power for good and God saw what they were trying to do and so he says come let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city as they went back to try to build they couldn't understand each other and you know how difficult it is to understand each other in the same language imagine with people suddenly speaking different languages and so they couldn't communicate with each other anymore so they had to stop building therefore its name is called Babel Babel that's where we get Babylon from. Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. He confused their language. And so unity is trying to do something for evil. They're trying to say, hey, we're so smart. There's no way God can do anything uh, against us anymore our city is going to reach to the highest heavens no flood is ever going to be able to touch us again but now God shows merciful judgment merciful judgment because of the confusion of tongues he didn't kill them he just confused their language and so that led to dispersion and from among them now they, they have to go all around the world and they kind of gathered together those that had the same language and they joined together and so on now from among those that scattered around the earth God chose one person his name was Abraham and through him God chose one family Jacob and his 12 sons and from them he founded one chosen nation the nation of Israel they are the only ones that are in communion with God they serve God they are holy separated for his purposes the rest of the nations are it seems forgotten and forsaken they are called Gentiles Gentiles 
anybody that's not a Jew, ethnically speaking. And so those Gentiles, they start worshiping false gods. So only one nation, the chosen nation, and the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9 tells us about this Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, service of God, and the promises. Notice all the benefits, spiritual, physical, land, the law of God, the love of God, and so on. They are the only ones that receive that special covenant with God. Of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Now, these Israelites who have all these advantages, these benefits in the relationship with God, they, were, uh, they received the, the law under Moses and they are called to go to Israel. No matter where they live, no matter where uh, they make their home, three times per year they were supposed to come back to their own land and celebrate three special annual feasts. Passover, which is Pesach, the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot in Hebrew, and the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. Every male was supposed to come back to the land and celebrate those feasts in the land. Passover, of course, details, it's a reenactment, a memorial of this salvation from Egypt that uh, Israel uh, received from God. 50 days after is the Feast of Pentecost. That's what Pentecost actually means, 50. Shavuot. Uh, in Hebrew. It comes 50 days after the Passover. And that's when they would celebrate the first harvest, the first fruits of the harvest. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, which would celebrate the final harvest. And they had the custom of coming to Jerusalem, bringing sheaves and celebrating that first harvest, presenting those sheaves to the Lord. Now we started talking about the spirit and the promise that God gave to these people. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Why is that so out of the ordinary? Because only three types of people receive the Holy Spirit under the old covenant. First, kings like Saul and David. They were the anointed ones of God. Number two, of course, prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Samuel. They were anointed with the Holy Spirit. And then there was limited individuals that were chosen for a specific task. As God gave his spirit to somebody to help build the tabernacle in the desert, for instance. So it's only special people. Now... Notice, we talked about the whole world, but the nations are on one side. They don't have anything to do with God. They don't know His laws. They don't know His name. They don't celebrate the feasts, and they don't receive the Holy Spirit. But now within Israel, the chosen people, the 12 tribes, only some of them have access to the Holy Spirit. Kings, prophets, and one or two more individuals and so you can see how important then it is when God says in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and when we reach Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament this happens after the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and it says when the day of Pentecost had fully come that word fully there Pleroma in Greek, the plenitude. I, I, could, I could even, I'm tempted to translate that as when the true Pentecost had fully come. Oh, 
I, I, I'm trying to stick to my notes, and that's why I have notes, and I'm trying to read them, all right? Because, because there's just so much in this. Uh, the, in Pentecost, the Jewish people celebrated the, the time when they actually were around Mount Sinai, and God gave them the tablets of the law. They celebrated that reception of God's word. And now this Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, when the true Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Uh, you want to know that's the, the, the apostles, the disciples, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the, the brothers and sisters of Jesus were present in there as well. Read Acts chapter 1. And suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and, and, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all. We should highlight that word in our Bibles. There was about 120 of them together, and suddenly they were all. They weren't kings, certainly they weren't prophets, but suddenly God said, this is the true Pentecost. This is what everything else was driving at. This is the time I have chosen. Oh, hallelujah. And just as the sheep were being burned at the, uh, at the temple at that time, the, 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 the first harvest, I said, the first, has, the first harvest, sorry, I said, they, they would bring those sheep and, and give them as an offering to God. And as they were being burned up to God, now God is saying, no, 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 that's really good. But this is the offering that I want my spirit to fall upon. And that's why cloven tongues like a of fire appeared upon each one of them. God is saying, this is my first harvest Amen. and so they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance I don't know if you knew but this is a Pentecostal church I know I know it's a it's Fountain of Truth, Apostolic Church, but it is Pentecostal. What does that mean, brother? It means that we believe that Pentecost is for you as well as for us today. It wasn't limited just to the apostles. It's for everyone. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In Acts Chapter 2, verse 5, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Notice, now this is, this is centuries and centuries after uh, Babel and after the scattering. And even after the Israel became a nation, uh, you know that because of idolatry and all of that, Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem and they took them in exile. And so they were scattered across the earth. And so we get to the first century where Jesus and the apostles lived. And, and we see that there is Jewish people living in all nations under heaven. And so now this is one of the three annual feasts. So they came back to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of Pentecost. And, and so as they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. Because everyone heard the apostles speak in his own language the apostles and the other disciples then they were all amazed and marveled saying to one another look are not all these who speak Galileans and how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born Parthians and Medes and Elamites those dwelling in Mesopotamia Judea and Cappadocia Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, and they were looking at each other and saying, whatever could this mean? Or the KJB that says, what meaneth this? 
And I, I can understand, perhaps some of our visitors today are like, you know, really confused. What, why are they talking about speaking in tongues? What, what kind of thing is that for a Sunday morning sermon? Right? What is the meaning of this? But others mocking said, they are full of new wine. They are drunk. Now, when you are walking down the street and you hear somebody speaking in another language, could be German, Swedish, I don't know. You don't look at them saying, drunk. Right? That, that's not your first response. So that's why we, 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 we think that there's something else going on. I mean, there's, you, you can't receive the Holy Spirit, you know, just all dignified. I mean, something happens when the fight... Listen... You know I'm trying to contain, my, contain myself right now, right? When the, when, when the law was given at Mount Sinai, read your Bible. It says the whole mountain trembled because the glory of God had descended upon the mountain. And you expect this tiny little fleshly tabernacle not to shake when the Holy Spirit falls upon me? Are you, you expect me not to at least clap my hands, lift them up, and say hallelujah, glory, and start speaking in tongues? You know what? Don't make me mad. Pastor is not here, so <laughs> I got to behave. But I've seen some of you on Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, you can say ouch. Or say amen. But I've seen you more excited there than I see you on Sunday mornings here. And, and South America is more about soccer than football. But my dad used to say that's 22 men in underwear running after a ball. Right? And people are so excited about it. Listen, I think we're trying to tame the Holy Spirit. Because we have become so dignified. I, I got my college degree. I mean, I can't be, you know, hula hooping and, and running the aisles and all of that. I mean, what, what are people going to say? They're probably going to look at you and say, what meaneth this? What happened to them? And I hear them speaking in a language that I don't even understand. These people must be local. That's what's happening here. They're full of new wine. But Peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice. He screamed and yelled at them. <laughs> and he said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and heed my words. But these are not drunk. As you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, it's only 9 a.m. I mean, drunks do not get up early to get drunk. They stay late the night before, and they, they sleep until noon. Are you, are you with me? These are not drunk, like you suppose. This is the power of the Holy Ghost. When was the last time somebody thought these people in church were drunk? Yes, ouch. When was the last time our neighbors thought, what's going on in that house? They were singing a, a song about Jesus and now suddenly they're yelling and screaming and I don't even know what kind of gibberish I can hear from them. These are not drunk. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. They had waited centuries and centuries, generation after generation. Everyone hoping, I hope it's us. Because the king has the Holy Ghost and the prophet has the Holy Ghost. But I don't have no Holy Ghost. And we're waiting for the promise of Joel. And then suddenly, Peter is announcing it in the middle of Pentecost. There's thousands and thousands of people in Jerusalem. And then suddenly, these men who are all Galileans start speaking in tongues and say, What is going on? And why are they acting so weird? 
This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit, not on Mount Sinai, but upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Hey! I want to be one of those old men. Because they say, you know, when you get to a certain age, you're like, oh, I'm just going to sit here and let myself die. All I got to do, all I have to look forward to is just a casket. And no, he says, no, when you get the Holy Spirit, the old men are going to start dreaming dreams again. They're going to be saying, oh, I look at that mountain. I'm 80 years old, but I think I can conquer it. Why? Because I got the Holy Ghost. But it's not for kings only anymore. And my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Hey, did you hear that? It has nothing to do with your social status or class. It has nothing to do with what you do for work, for a living. I mean, men servants and maid servants. Oh, they will also, he says, get my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy they shall prophesy what a weird experience oh but we believe that in this church don't we we believe this can happen today as well I mean today I mean in this place I mean here But I, yeah, I know why you, you're wondering, why would God choose tongues? Why not something else like a feeling of peace? So that I can just be sitting and nobody knows I got nothing. Or, I, I don't know, something else. Well, let, let, me, let me give you at least three. There, there, there's probably more. There's, give me, let, let me give you at least three reasons why God chose tongues as the sign that the Holy Spirit is in you. Number one, it's an external, visible, and immediate evidence. Because some people say, well, you know when somebody has the Holy Spirit because of the fruit of the Spirit. You know, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness. Yeah, but you got to wait to see that. Right? Like how many months am I going to be looking at you whether you have the Holy Ghost or not? No, no, no. This is, this is immediate. Notice what Acts chapter 10, 45 and 46 says. And those of the circumcision, that's the Jews, who believed, that was Jewish believers in Jesus, were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. How did they know that the Holy Spirit had fallen on non-Jewish people? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. How do I know if I've got the Holy Spirit? Well, if you got to ask you don't have it. Because when you get it, you know you got it. Are you with me? I'll give you a Bible for that. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign. That's a sign that you have the Holy Spirit. You don't have to doubt. Come on, did you know that there's, there's hundreds of people every year that go to their pastor in other churches saying, Pastor, do I have the Holy Spirit? Do you think I have it, Pastor? That is a sad situation. You should know if you have it. You should know when you got it. So that's the first reason. It's an external, immediate evidence. Number two, it's a universal and uniform sign. That means that big and small, rich and poor, outgoing and shy, loud and not so much, old and young, male and female, everyone can know they have the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 
For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now talk about drunk. <laughs> Did you know that the Bible itself talks about the Holy Spirit as wine? It compares it to that. It says, do not be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. The result may be a little similar, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Woo! Come on now. It's Super Bowl Sunday. Somebody yell. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. One spirit. We were all baptized into one body. Jews and Greeks, slaves and free. We all drank of the same spirit. And so that's reason number two. Let me give you a third one. It's a demonstration of God's total control. James 3.8 says, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. See, somebody gets on your nerves... You know, you're going to go, and you're going to contain it. But this tongue slips. <laughs> right? You're not going to hit somebody, but you're going to tell them something. At least you're going to be like, yeah, God bless you too. <laughs> right? I mean, that's why no one can tame the tongue. How many times, you know, you, you try to contain it. I'm like, oh, I, mean, oh, I didn't want to say that. But now imagine. When you surrender yourself to God completely. You give him your Everything. Your heart, your mind, your hands, your whole being. What better way for God to show, I got this one. That he starts controlling the one member of your body that nobody can control. And then suddenly starts speaking a heavenly language. And you know, oh, God, God's got that one. Oh, God got that one too. He's got it. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 11, the Jews testified, we hear them speaking in, an, in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And that's what you do when you receive the Holy Spirit. Start speaking in an unknown, unknown language. It's a demonstration of God's total control over your life. And so Peter as he says, tells them, these are not drunk as you suppose. But th this is the power of the Holy Ghost. And he preaches to them about Jesus and about how they had rejected him. About how they crucified him and, and he was buried. But he rose again on the third day. You know why? Because he had to pay the price so that everyone could receive the Holy Spirit. I told you, there's only one nation that was chosen. Only one family, one man, Abraham, one family, Jacob and his sons, Israel. Only them. Why? Because everybody else, uh, uh, pagan nations, worshiping idols, serving false gods. And somebody had to pay for that sin. And Jesus did. He did that for us. He paid for our sins on the cross. So that God could freely pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And so in Acts 2.37... Now when they heard this, the crowd that gathered, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They realized they rejected their Messiah. They realized they missed the time that they had awaited for centuries and centuries had come and they couldn't see it. Then Peter said to them, repent. 
And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So that your paganism, your idolatry, all your sins are washed away. And guess what? And you too shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all those who are afar off. As many as the Lord our God shall call. Not notice that. And to all who are afar off. For whom? For everyone else. And perhaps you're thinking, my church doesn't teach this. Well... Thank God God brought you to this church. <laughs> because unfortunately most of Christianity is living their so-called Christian life on the wrong side of Pentecost. Yes, they, they, they're okay with Jesus and the cross. They're okay with the tomb. They're okay with his resurrection. And they said that's where we stay. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Go all the way to Pentecost. Let God's fire fall. So you need to hear the announcement. Pentecost has already come. And when it comes, it doesn't go away. Why? Because he said, in the last days. If you don't believe me, go ask your pastor. Pastor, are we still living in the last days? If he says yes, you got a right to speak in tongues. Because in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So number one, is it still the last days? Yes. The second is, are you still flesh? That's all we need to have a Pentecost. A God willing to pour himself out and somebody thirsty enough to drink that new wine. Now, the Jews could not associate with Gentiles. Non-Jews. The whole world so then was divided into two. Jews and non-Jews. Chosen people and la chusma. <laughs> that was it. In Acts 10, 28, listen to this. Peter said to some Gentiles, he said, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. Remember Samaria? They're, they're going across to the other side. And, and, the, and the, the Jews used to go around Samaria. Because Samaritans, they're, they're, not, they're not fully Jews, you see. So they couldn't associate. They couldn't eat with them. So it was chusma, chusma. But then a rumor started going around about Peter among the disciples in Jerusalem. He went in and had lunch with a Gentile. What? Peter? No way. Well, we got to ask him. Somebody go get him. Right? What's going on? We don't do that. We are the chosen people. And said, what happened, Peter? Were they serving fajitas? I mean, how did they tempt you? And in Acts chapter 11, verse 2, And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. They were all believers in Jesus. They were all saved. But this was such a big issue that they started contending with him, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning. Saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying. And I need you to get this, all right? I need you to get this. I know there's a lot of scripture. And, and, and God forbid we use a lot of scripture in a sermon. Hallelujah. All right? I need you to get this. I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance I saw a vision. An object descending like a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners. And it came to me. 
When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. Things that the law of God said, do not partake of them. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But I said, no, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now this was done three times and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me, everybody say, it was the Spirit's doing. The Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren, Jewish brethren, accompanied me and we entered the man's house. You see what's going on? God had to prepare him, showing him a vision. There was things that he couldn't eat in that vision. And he says, eat. And I, no, Lord. And he, had to eat. he did it a second time. Rise and eat. I can't eat. That's unclean. It's common. The third time, rise and eat. Okay, this means something else, Lord. What does this mean? And then suddenly the messengers come and he goes into a Roman centurion house. And then, verse 13, and he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, he started to preach. The Holy Spirit fell upon them and as upon us at the beginning. Now for us, that's just one verse. For a faithful Jewish person, this is an atomic bomb. The Holy Spirit fell upon them. Is he a Jewish king? No. Is he a Jewish prophet? No. He's not even Jewish. Then I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us. Hey. If you think God really loves you, would he give the apostles a gift that he doesn't want to give to you? Would he give Mary and, and, and Matthew and John and Peter a gift that he doesn't want to give to you? It's the same God. For God so loved the world. And so God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could withstand God? So Peter said, it wasn't the fajitas. It was God. God that did it. When they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. <laughs> Now notice, you can, you can read about this in Acts chapter 10, all right? The Bible says the angel appeared to Cornelius and he said, Your prayers and your alms have risen before God as a testimony and that's why he sent me to you. So the, the Roman centurion wasn't saved because he believed in God. Hello? He wasn't saved because he gave alms, donations, or tithes. He, he wasn't saved because he was a good person. Though those things are good. I mean, he prayed so much and gave so much that God said, All right, you got my attention. You're a pagan Roman centurion, but you got my attention. And then he sent him an angel. If God sent some of you an angel, you never set foot in a church ever again. Because you're like, huh, I've seen an angel. What do I need to go listen to Medina over there? 
But you're not saved because you see angels. You're not saved because God healed you from cancer. You're not saved because of your religion. No, 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 no. There's still something you need to do in order to be saved. And notice if the angel didn't come preaching the gospel. He said, you need to send for somebody that has experienced the new birth. So they can tell you about this salvation. That's why, angel, that's why angels don't preach. Because they are not born again. And so, he wasn't saved. But God made a way for a thirsty soul. Peter will tell you what to do to be saved. And then that Roman centurion and his family find themselves in the presence of Jews speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives them the utterance. And thou oh, come on. And then Peter looks at them and says, we need to baptize them. They got half of it. They need the other half. They need to be born of water and of the Spirit. Talk about ethnic reconciliation. Because after that, Peter and that Roman centurion, a Roman... Romans were the ones that had subjugated Israel. They were the empire. And now they're sitting together eating. Well, I, I guess you can say Roman lives matter, huh? Yeah, Corinthian lives matter, and Ephesian lives matter, and African lives matter, and European and even Bolivian lives matter, all right? Hey, God is doing something in this world. He's working through His power, through His Spirit for global reconciliation upon all flesh. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, what, by what is called the circumcision, that is the Jews, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, Having no hope and without God in the world. That's all of us. Unless you're ethnically Jew. But everybody else. No God. No hope. No covenants. No Christ. Strangers. And aliens. Illegales pues. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So as to create in himself one new man from the two. Thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body, which is the church, if you don't know that, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, uh, having built up on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, Feed it together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Did you know that he called you out of every nation to make you a holy temple in the Lord? In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And in God's love and purpose for the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike then, let me tell you, we find at least one more reason for tongues. One more reason. We're almost done. The confusion of tongues in Babel had put an end 
to a foolish attempt at salvation by man's work. They tried to build something that was going to be so high and so tall that no flood could ever destroy them. And they thought that's our salvation. But the confusion of tongues had dispersed the conspiracy of man is sufficient. We have the science. We have the knowledge. We have the strength. We can save ourselves. What foolishness. It had to be confused. It had to be dispersed. But today, in giving people the ability to speak in an unknown language, in an unknown tongue that they had never learned, Bring them back from dispersion. Bring them back from exile. Go call them to the north and to the south, east and west. Bring my children back. Let's reverse Babel. And that's another reason why God wants you to speak in tongues. Babel means confusion, but out of confusion. God brings out this one holy temple of God, the church of Christ. He wants to make one people out of all the nations of the earth. Notice what Revelation chapter 5 says. And they sang a new song to the Lamb saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. So we have gone from paradise lost to paradise restored from Genesis to Revelation. I wonder if are there any Jews in this church today? You can lift up your hand, your ethnic Jew. Any Mexican, lift up your hand. I see two or three, the rest are ashamed to be Mexican. You can't deny it. I see el nopal en tu frente. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody has Irish blood, Italian, African, Caribbean? Come on, yell out. If I didn't mention, yell out what your, what your nation is. All right, more. I, all right, say that again. All right, Filipinos. See, we have different nations. This is what God is doing. This is God's purpose. And yes, I know you speak in tongues, and I know you speak, I know you speak in tongues. See how those tongues are united as into one body. Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, it's an unknown tongue for you. But you see what it's telling us? It's telling us that the spirit within is crying out in tongues to God saying, you are now my father. Verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that now we are children of God. You were aliens and strangers, but now you're children of God. Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Babel itself is turned upside down. Through this new tongues, a celestial language, people from every nation and culture are made only one people, one nation. Babel, my friends, is undone in Jesus Christ. Hey, remember the people that said you'd never amount to anything? How wrong were they? Because now you are a child of God. Yes, he calls to himself Jew and non-Jew, good and bad, beautiful and ugly, winners and losers, and makes them all cry, Abba, Father. See the great celebration parade. Souls from every nation and culture and color and language worshiping the same Savior. The Lamb on His throne and everyone is saying, You are worthy. Yes. Yes. 
Acts 2 16 this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass in the last day says God that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy did I tell you how beautiful it is to see your children speaking in tongues your young men shall see visions your old men shall dream dreams and my on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit on those days and they shall prophesy so this brings us now to you who never knew you could speak in tongues as the Spirit of God fills you maybe they didn't preach this to you and I'm sorry for that I'm sorry because not not every pastor preaches this but they should they should this is the consummation of all the centuries but thank God you are here now or perhaps there's another kind of person you who thought that your prayers your offerings your candles your goodness your religion gave you salvation Perhaps you've been healed miraculously of sin angels and you think I am saved and God is saying no, no, you still need my spirit within you. It will sanctify you, it will justify you, it will regenerate you, it will make you be born again. You need my spirit within you. But then there's others that are apostolic that Perhaps you think that you have to become somebody better before God gives you His Spirit. Perhaps doubt has entered your heart thinking, I don't deserve it. I need to become super spiritual, super good to deserve receiving the Holy Spirit. But hey, no, 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 because it's given by grace. And it's given so it can help you become perfect. You don't have to be perfect before you get the Holy Spirit. But you are here today. And if you are flesh, God is here ready to give you His Holy Spirit. Now, if you're a visitor, Peter's answer is still valid for us today. And now Peter is saying to you, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall you shall it's not a you may it's a you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit stand with me please For the promise is unto you. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off who thought they were just too far gone, too unworthy. As many as the Lord our God shall call. And if you're here today, God called you. Babel is undone. And His promise is true today too. These are the last days. If you ever need to doubt that, just watch the news and you're going to know these are the last days. So let, 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 let's make our way to the front right now. Especially those that want the Holy Spirit. Especially those that never spoke in tongues and you think, man, I know now this is for me. And it is because God gave me a message just for you. This is the time. This is the God-ordained place. Come a little closer, please. Come a little closer. There's more people coming. Now we don't look for the tongues, we look for God. We give ourselves to Him. We surrender our hands and we raise them in praise. 
We surrender our tongues to Him as well as our hearts. And as you praise audibly, God needs to hear you. Your tongue has to be saying praises. And then God will control your whole body, including your tongue. And then suddenly, the I love you, Jesus, that you were saying are going to turn into something you don't understand. It's your spirit crying out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Just let it go. Just keep going and let God speak through you. And you will speak this language of God's kingdom. And you will know that you are a son of God. You will know that you are a daughter of the King. Let's praise Him right now. Let's praise Him right now.